Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today and taking the time to learn about what's coming in Data IQ 11. My name is Christina Shao. I work in technical product marketing here at Data IQ, and I'm really excited to be able to share with you a preview of what's coming in Data IQ's next major release of our platform, Data IQ 11, which is due to arrive this July. If you do have any questions following this presentation, please feel free to submit them in the comment section, and a member of the Data IQ team will be in touch. Now, before we dive into what's coming in 11, I want to talk a little bit about what we have today in our current version, Data IQ 10. Hopefully by now, all of you have had a chance to um, try it out for yourself, take a look at some of the new features. Um, you may remember that in Data IQ 10, we focused heavily on MLOps. And so we released features like the model evaluation store, model comparisons, and ML flow model import. We also made a big push on AI governance and oversight, and we introduced for the first time the Govern node, which includes standard workflows, a model registry, and uh, approvals and sign-offs. And lastly, we introduced and delivered a lot of accelerators to help you get faster time to business value. So in addition to the large library of industry solutions, which we continue to add to each month, we also added things like workspaces and additional geospatial capabilities. Now in Data IQ 11, we continue to expand and enhance those capabilities I just mentioned, but also add new features to really empower folks across the organization from the most expert data scientists to those tech savvy line of business specialists to leaders and executives. Now, when we think about what's in this release, we really have three main goals. The first is to engage your expert technical community. So let me explain this a little bit more. We recognize that the most advanced profiles, you know, maybe your advanced data scientists, your ML engineers, data engineers, and so forth, typically are their coder personas. They add a lot to the AI value creation but they often uh, find themselves spending a lot of their cycles on more mundane tasks, like accessing and connecting to data and continuing to clean it, and maybe engineer it for machine learning or staging infrastructure and environments to do those experiments. Or if a model's in production, maybe they're spending a lot of time babysitting them to ensure that they behave properly in production. And so our goal with this release is to give them capabilities which makes it easier for them to do their job reduces the technical overhead, frees them up to work more on those moonshot projects rather than on the mundane. But of course, we recognize that to succeed at everyday AI, it requires more than empowering just your most technical experts. It also means giving visual tools to people in the business uh, so that they can combine their domain expertise with those tools to really drive value. So think of marketing analysts being able to solve problems like churn or market basket analysis, or finance analysts being able to solve problems like demand forecasting using visual tools. And lastly, of course, no company wants to be in the midst of an AI gone wrong story. And so it's important for us to continue to give organizations uh, tools that increase trust and build confidence with stakeholders and provide for better documentation and um, kind of risk mitigation for the AI projects. Now, the rest of the time we're gonna spend on the features within these three main themes, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention some of the other great capabilities uh, coming out with Data IQ 11, which serve some other audiences. So for example, for more of the business consumers or data analysts who really are more of AI consumers rather than creators, we've made it a lot easier for them to get value from uh, robust pivot tables, enhanced charting and dashboard experiences, workspace discussions, and so forth. For the specialists out there, we have even more geospatial capabilities and new goodies in the machine learning and, and auto ML uh, header. And to support our administrators, cloud architects, and so forth, who manage the Data IQ instances, who implement and install them, we have new tools to help them do resource monitoring and management, as well as get up to speed running quickly on Google Cloud Platform. 
So let's dive in a little bit more deeply. We'll start with the expert technical community. Uh, these folks, as I mentioned, tend to be code first profiles, and it can be challenging for them to connect their external stack or tooling with a data IQ project in order to contribute in the way they feel most comfortable. And so code studios are isolated coding environments connected to their favorite IDE, maybe Jupyter Labs or RStudio or VS Code that allow them to code in data IQ right within a project and contribute seamlessly with the rest of the team. And if they're using code to, let's say, build and test and evaluate machine learning models, rather than using the visual ML capabilities in DataIQ, we've also integrated with MLflow's experiment tracking so that they can use their, their IDE or their notebook to run those, those models. And each run is captured and the artifacts are stored seamlessly in DataIQ so that anyone can look at them. And when they're ready to select a final model, it's easy to promote it into DataIQ to be deployed, monitored, and governed. Now, as they work on machine learning projects, uh, it's, it's inevitable that they'll create great reference sets with clean, prepared, curated features. And it would be a shame if other people couldn't take advantage of that and start from that higher point instead of reinventing the wheel each time. So the central feature store registers those best reference data sets, the gold data sets that others can easily use and explore in their own projects. And finally, uh, computer vision tasks still re remain outside the reach of some data scientists because it's quite complex. And so we've really made it easy for, for data scientists or even citizen data scientists to go from having raw images to using our managed labeling framework, which is collaborative. It allows uh, project managers, annotation managers to really keep an eye on all the different people marking up those images and resolve conflicts and achieve consensus on the labels. And then use that label data immediately in a visual task for object detection or image classification. So let's take a look at how these work in Data IQ. Let's first look at code studios. So let's say I'm working in a project where there's a code recipe, Python recipe, and you know that I can edit it already in an editor here, the built-in one, or in a Jupyter notebook, but now I can also edit it in a code studio. And the code studios are those built-in, isolated uh, development environments. So I can choose this one, I chose VS Code, but I could choose RStudio or Jupyter Labs, for example. And it's going to show me in my workspace all of the available things that I can edit. For example, recipes, code recipes, or libraries, as you see here. And I can take advantage of my favorite uh, tools and helpers from within VS Code. So for example, uh, I can take advantage of autocomplete. I can use the, uh, the documentation here that's built in the autodocs by just hovering over to see syntax helpers. I can set breakpoints and even run this step-by-step -step to debug, for example. So just an example of how you can use that familiar framework to code um, while still being inside your Dataku project. When I sync this file back, and if I were to go back to the flow and reopen that Python recipe, you would see these two, two new lines that I had added in from VS Code. Alternatively, you can even use this for Streamlit or other custom uh, web app stacks that you might want to take advantage of. So in this case, I can see here uh, a side-by-side -side view of the VS code of my web application along with what it's gonna look like with those dynamic Streamlit visualizations. And when I finish developing the web application, I can simply publish it to send it back to the general web apps area within Dataiku. And you can see here, we've already published it here, and now I can serve it uh, just the same as I would with a Dash or Bokeh or our Shiny app that I might have built in the same interface. So let's say uh, rather than uh, coding a code recipe, I'm doing some model development, but I'm doing it programmatically. So here I have a Jupyter notebook where I'm, I'm developing some experiments for a classification model, and you can see I've loaded some training data in, I've specified um, my experiment, set the hyperparameters of my run, and I have some cells here for actually doing the run. Now, as I hit 
um, you know, shift enter and I run this cell, it's going to output the metrics of my model, the outcome, the performance and things like that. But I don't really have a great way short of writing this down or taking screenshots of remembering what the settings were that led to each outcome. So what's happening now with our MLflow integrations is we're actually logging all of this using the experiment tracking behind the scenes to um, a center place in the user interface. So you can say, for example, these are all of the experiments that we've run from that notebook. And you can visually compare the performance metrics across each run, dive into any one to see additional details, run artifacts, the pickle file here. And when it comes time to my selected model, I can either deploy it here and it will be promoted as a saved model object within Dataiku with versioning and so forth so it can be deployed and governed. Or alternatively, back in the notebook, I could, I could programmatically deploy it using the APIs and the model import. Now let's move into Feature Store. Now, as data scientists create data assets, you can imagine some of them are quite good for reuse or for reference data sets that they could use or their teammates could use later. And so what you can do with any data set is you can share it and you can actually promote it as a feature group. So I can publish it here as a feature group. It's already been done. And what that does is it says, okay, this data set should be stored in the central feature store. So now it's discoverable by other people and they can browse and say, okay, what is this data set about? What does the schema look like? The descriptions of the columns, the data set freshness and so forth. And when they're ready to use it in their own project, if it's been shared with them, uh, they can click this button and it's going to be exposed into their own project very seamlessly. So this saves people a lot of time. Now, lastly, for our experts, you may recall, we talked about deep learning and managed labeling. So let's go take a look at that. Okay, to illustrate this feature, let's imagine we have a use case where we're trying to do object detection on images of whether or not people are wearing personal protective equipment, like a helmet or a, a visibility vest, for example, for compliance purposes. So we can take a look at some of these images. You can see some face shields, some gloves, eye protection, reflective vests, and so forth. And we want to do a model using deep learning that says this person is wearing PPE and which kind, but we don't have enough labeled data. So we use Dataiku to actually generate that labeled data by using this built-in labeling task. And in settings, the task manager or the program or project manager can set up how this annotation should be done. So we can actually see examples of the images they would specify the different classes that are available for that annotation, give instructions, and maybe say each label, uh, each image has to be labeled by at least two labelers before it's considered labeled, and give permissions to the annotators or the people who are allowed to review and resolve conflicts. Now, as those people come in, they're able to mark up and use the buttons, or they can use keyboard shortcuts, to highlight the different areas and mark them up. So we can just do a couple here, save and next. They would have this experience and the manager as they go can see that who's labeled it, other people who've come in in the status and, and track the progress. Now when they come in review, they're also able to resolve conflicts. Let's say two people labeled something differently or the bounding boxes didn't overlap enough. So they can pick which one is correct uh, or even draw a new, a new box if they prefer. So once data is, is labeled, now they're ready to go ahead and, you know, do a task, let's say for example, for object detection. Or in a different example, I'll show you image classification, it's the other visual task. In this case, we have a data set of casting images some of which which have defects and some do not. So here's an example of what a defect looks like, just that little dot there. And they could be anywhere on this casted piece. 
Using that visual analysis in the lab that we looked at before, we can do image classification. As you would expect with Dataiku's AutoML, in the Design tab, we see examples of the different classes, defective and not defective. We can alter the optimization. Uh, we can talk about how we can affect the fine tuning, train and test set sampling and splitting, and the metric to optimize for. Also built in is the ability to augment the image data by doing flips or rotations or color shifts or cropping to provide more diversity and more number of training samples. When ready to train, you can activate GPUs to accelerate the run times. And as you would expect, dig into any of the uh, models in this experiment to take a look at how the accuracy was. Interactively, we can explore the type one and type two errors here and even do what if analysis where I could drag in uh, sample images here and have it on the fly predict whether or not this piece is predicted to be defective or not. Okay, a lot of great goodies for our experts. Let's move on now to things that are going to empower the tech savvy folks in the line of business, business analysts, citizen data scientists. They often have the closest connection to customers and the data, but not always the, the tools that the central analytics team has to execute things like visual time series forecasting or outcome optimization. So in Data IQ 11, we offer visual tasks that make it easy for people to do time series statistics and exploration all the way into robust forecasting models, which then again can be governed, monitored, and deployed in Data IQ. And we make it easier for them to share assets amongst themselves. So uh, quite often, you know, somebody says, oh, I realize you have this project. It has data that I need. It has a model or a notebook that I need. Can you share it with me? We've made that process even more seamless by allowing people to expose reusable objects so that anyone who can see them can reuse them in their own projects. Outcome optimization, I'm really excited about. It is a way to enhance decision support. So think about the ability of not just what if analysis, given these inputs, what's the prediction, but also what should I change to get to the outcome that I want, the best possible outcome. So we'll show you that. And lastly, visual logic. You're gonna love this. If you write a lot of if then else statements as formulas in Dataiku, or you do complex filters, uh, you're gonna love the new interface we've put in place to make it really easy to build conditional logic and translate your subject matter expertise into uh, business rules within your data IQ projects. So let's take a look in DSS. We'll start with visual time series. Uh, we have a couple things to show here. First, we'll talk about uh, time series statistics, and then we'll go into the time series forecasting visual task, as you see here. So in this example, we have some time series data. Let's take a look at the input data set first. You can see here we have um, ticker values, stock ticker values. For each date, we have the adjusted close price of three different major US airlines. So we have American, Delta, and United Airlines data here. And over in charts, as always, we can do line charts to look at visual trends and understand the volatility of these stock tickers. But if we go over to the interactive statistics tab, you can see here a new set of cards for stationarity, trends, auto correlations, different types of analysis. So I've added one of each of those cards here to this worksheet so you can see what those outputs look like. Now going back to the flow, um, if we look at the lab, we can open the analysis here. And we'll select our target variable and the date feature that we'll use for the forecast. And just like with regular AutoML for um, a prediction task, we can choose the different presets. And in design, we would go in and we can say, here's our, our time step parameters, maybe our forecasting horizon set quantiles and so forth. 
Over in the train and test set, we have some options here for preparation. So specifically time series resampling, if your data is not Equispaced, you might want to do some extrapolation or interpolation, for example. And what I like here are the, the text-based descriptions you can kind of see here below of what's happening and a visual on the right that shows what the technique you chose will do to fill those values. For external features, if you have future values for the validation set, you can include those in your model as well. For algorithms, we have both the traditional statistical algorithms as well as deep learning algorithms. So we would train our model and then go over to the, the uh, results tab to inspect each of the different algorithms we chose. So we'll choose the deep AR model. And here on the forecast values, we can explore for each of our series, what that forecast looks like, turn on and off confidence intervals, explore, you know, what that looks like for each individual airline in this case. So this is the visual time series forecasting. We'll move into what if analysis here. Um, hopefully you're aware of what if analysis in our models where you can interactively change input values and see what the prediction will then be and the um, individual prediction explanations. In this case, this is a regression where we're trying to predict the hotness of a song. In other words, a numeric measure of how popular the song is. And in this case, we have so many different song characteristics and our question is, what's the best that can happen? How can we maximize the song's hotness, its popularity? So with uh, outcome optimization, I would go and choose that and maybe select max as my ideal outcome. And then I can choose which features I want to uh, potentially affect. So some I might want to turn off because I can't change them. Maybe who sings it or how popular they are. But I can affect the others and I can even set some constraints. So for example, if I don't want uh, for radio a really long fade in or fade out, or I don't want a very long song, I can uh, kind of ratchet all those settings in and then compute some different paths to getting to that maximal outcome. So here you can see different paths to get us to higher hotness scores, the, the maximum hotness score and a plausibility rating, which helps us understand how close to the actual data in our test set um, this, this simulated record is. So this helps you kind of prescribe the best thing for the business to do to get to the outcome that you want. Now in the interest of time, I'm going to skip showing the seamless sharing uh, capabilities, but there is a video you can watch on the website that goes into that in detail. And I'm going to very quickly talk a little bit about some of the if then else statements that I mentioned a moment ago. Um, this is a prepare recipe where you typically might want to take the values of a column and if they're this value, then rename them, relabel them, or somehow code them and bin them into some other value. So we do have binning, we do have find and replace and things like that, but you find yourself using formulas sometimes that are quite complicated and nested. And so we have some new options. The first is to use the switch formula, which takes the category name with the values and basically says, if the value is this, then replace it with this label in the output column, for example. So this is one option is the switch formula. A second is to use the switch uh, processor, which essentially gives you a GUI to do this type of work. So it says if the value is gas, then relabel it in this output column as essential. And you can see here, the mapping doesn't have to be one-to-one. -one. You can kind of set it up however you like. So this is the second option. Finally, if you have something a little bit more complex, maybe you want to use multiple columns and you want to affect multiple columns, you can actually create quite complex conditional logic using this nice visual framework. So if the FICO score is less than 300 or greater than 850, then it's invalid. Else do this. Else if some other condition, do that. So you can see here, you can kind of keep track of your logic and for other users looking at the recipe later, they have a nice summary of what the, the business rules in this recipe are. 
And this user interface is applied everywhere that you would have filters. So in the design sample, in the pre and post filters of other visual recipes that are SQL based and many other places. So definitely go watch that video to learn more about these additional uh, new ways to do visual if logic. With that, let's go back to the slides. Okay, and lastly, expanding executive confidence and control. This theme is all about creating oversight, a centralized control center that allows leaders, executives, program and project managers to understand what's happening with each AI project across its life cycle and ensure that it's going through the right checks and balances as it moves um, from design into production and maybe even end of life. So we have the flow document generator. This adds to our portfolio of um, model documentation, which you may be familiar with. And it's a click button for an auto doc of your entire project flow. So showing an image of what the flow looks like, a catalog of all the data sets and, and uh, the details and schema within those. So this is a really great thing to add to, let's say, um, documentation for a project as you move into project governance with expanded capabilities to do sign off and approvals on analytics projects, whether or not they have a model or not, doesn't really matter. You can still govern it and the workflow. So some enhancements to the govern module. And then lastly, we'll show model stress tests. And this is a great thing for both data scientists as well as IT operators who might be wanting to do some tests on a model before it goes into production to ensure that it behaves and performs as well under um, live data conditions as it did against the curated data that you trained and evaluated it with. So let's take a look at some of the features here. We'll move kind of quickly here towards the end, and I'll just show you two features. One is the uh, automatic flow documentation. So you can see here, we've gone back to our flow and down at the bottom in flow actions, I can choose this export documentation, either use the default template or um, from our documentation, you can access the Word doc that forms the template and you can edit it to map to your own company's color standards, formatting, font, and so forth, and then just upload it. But today we'll just go ahead and click download. It'll export this flow documentation. So now our export uh, flow documentation is complete. We've downloaded it. We can go over to the Word document that it's produced and you can kind of see in a long table of contents here, we have the project general description. Uh, we'll have a picture of the flow and then we have a list of all of the data sets in this particular project manage folders, um, saved models, deployment and monitoring details, and so forth. And so you can see without doing much of anything, I went ahead and was able to archive a snapshot of exactly what was in my project flow at this moment. Uh, this can be automated through scenarios. It can be um, executed from the API. So this can be part of a standard, uh, let's say workflow for finalizing a project that might go into production to make sure that we have a snapshot of how it looks at that moment with that version. So nice option here for our AI governance portfolio. Um, similarly, if we go back to the flow and we pick on a model, in this case, it's a saved model, and we'll go to the active version. And down under model views, we can find the stress test center. So when this opens, we see on the left, the panel of available stress tests we can choose from. So let's say for example, we want to simulate for our model, what would happen in production if the target distribution were to shift? We can choose uh, which target class we think might change and specify the proportion. Or we can also do another test to say, what happens if we have missing values for one or more features that are important to the model? Or what happens if ambient conditions change by some um, factor and we can multiply all of the, the inputs by a coefficient? How robust is the model to be able to handle these types of corruptions if they were to occur on live data? So we'll go ahead and run the battery of tests. It runs them each independently and gives us a before and after comparison of our original test data 
compare directly to this corrupted data. So we can see whether or not the performance and the behavior is what we expect and what we want before we actually choose to deploy this model or potentially replace a live model in production. So you can see how this would be useful for operators, for data scientists when they're doing uh, checks to make sure that they're responsibly releasing new versions of models that will work well in production. Welcome back. That was a lot I know. Thanks for sticking with me. This concludes our presentation on what's coming in Data IQ 11. I hope you're as excited as we are to get your hands on these new features and see how they deliver benefits to your own projects. And we can't wait to hear how it goes. If you do have questions, again, please feel free to put them in the comment section on this video and a member of the Data IQ team will be in touch. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day.